Good evening and welcome to the St. Augustine Center for Ethics, Religion, and Culture at the College of Our Lady of the Elms. I'm Dr. Peter DiPergola, Shauna's Family Chair for the Study of the Humanities, Associate Professor of Bioethics and Medical Humanities, and Executive Director of the St. Augustine Center. I have the distinct honor of hosting tonight's distinguished lecture in ethics. Please note that tonight's event is being recorded and will be uploaded on the Elms College YouTube channel within the next few days. Immediately following tonight's lecture, there will be an opportunity to engage directly with our distinguished speaker. Please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We ask that you please avoid using the chat box to submit questions. Before we begin tonight's event, let us take a moment to consciously place ourselves in the presence of God. To that end, it is now my pleasure to introduce Isamar Perez, first year secondary education in history double major, who will offer a prayer to St. Camillus de Lelith, patron saint of healthcare workers. Glorious St. Camillus, turn your merciful eyes upon those who suffer and in a special way upon those who care for them. Grant to the sick a holy restfulness and a profound trust in the goodness and power of Christ. Assist healthcare workers to be generous and lovingly dedicated to the dignity of those entrusted to their solicitude. Provide all who are present this evening with a deeper understanding of the mystery of suffering as a means of redemption. May your protection comfort the sick and their families and encourage them to live together in love. Bless those who dedicate themselves to the poverty of health and through your holy intercession, may the Lord grant peace and hope to all. Amen. Thank you, Isamar, for that beautiful centering prayer. Dr. Charlie Camosi is Professor of Medical Humanities at Creighton University School of Medicine and concurrently holds the Monsignor Curran Fellowship in Moral Theology at St. Joseph Seminary in New York. Prior to joining the faculty at Creighton and St. Joseph, Professor Camosi spent 14 years in the Department of Theology at Fordham University, which he joined after earning his PhD in Moral Theology from the University of Notre Dame in 2008. Dr. Camosi's published work has appeared in the American Journal of Bioethics, Journal of Medicine and Philosophy, Journal of the Health, uh, Catholic Health Association, New York Times, Washington Post, New York Daily News, in America, the Jesuit Review. He has monthly columns with the Religion News Service in Angeles and does weekly interviews for The Pillar. Professor Camosi is the author of seven books with an eighth on the way. Peter Singer in Christian Ethics was named a best book by ABC Religion and Ethics in 2012. Beyond the Abortion Wars was an award winner with the Catholic Media Association in 2015. In Resisting Throwaway Culture was named Resource of the Year by Catholic Publishers Association in 2020. His most recent book, Bioethics for Nurses, A Christian Moral Vision, was published this past July. Dr. Camosi is the founding editor of the Magenta Project, a new book series with New City Press. In addition to advising the Pro-Life Commission of the Archdiocese of New York and receiving the 2018 St. Jerome Award for Scholarly Excellence from the Catholic Library Association, Professor Camosi was recently made a Knight of the St. Peter Claver Society. He and his wife, Pauline, have four children three of whom they adopted from a Filipino orphanage in 2016. Please join me in extending the warmest possible welcome to Dr. Charlie Camosi, who will deliver the 2022 Distinguished Lecture in Ethics on the topic of another of his award-winning books titled Losing Our Dignity, How Secularized Medicine is Undermining Fundamental Human Equality. Is that my cue? <laughs> okay. It's great to be with all of you this evening. Um, and thank you for, for the very warm uh, welcome. Uh, it's always weird to hear um, your bio read to you like that before you start these things. I'm just grateful for all the help I've received over the years uh, with regard to so many of those, uh, those things. 
Um, let's see if I can share my screen here as I begin presentation. Hopefully that is working. So one of the um, one of the first things uh, folks tell you about uh, doing a slide presentation is don't have slides that are just totally full of text, right? So naturally, um, my first slide is totally full of text, but I'm going to tell you right off the bat that this will be the only slide that is going to be like that this evening. I just wanted to get my um, central thesis kind of out there and you can see what I'm going to be doing this evening. I always at least like to have a sense of where someone is going in their presentation. Um, Cause sometimes if they appear to be wandering, I'm like, what is this going to be over? But, um, but here's, here's essentially where I want to prove if I can this evening, I'll be interested of course, to hear your questions, please ask your questions, especially if you disagree with something I'm, I'm suggesting here. So the first point is our secularized and even irreligious culture, especially in, in medicine and other institutions with incredible power, particularly over life and death, no longer has the resources to explain why all human beings are equal. Once we abandon the theological idea that all members of the human family are equal because they share a common nature, which bears the image and likeness of God, we didn't have anything left but actualized concepts like autonomy, rationality, self-awareness, will, productivity, yada, yada, yada. You probably heard them all a million times in which to understand and locate moral value. Um, it goes without saying, perhaps, human beings do not have all these capacities in equal measure. Um, some don't have them at all. And that's especially true of disabled uh, human beings. And more and more human populations are falling out of the circle of protection that fundamental human equality provides. And it's time to sound the alarm, in my view, on where this is going. Um, so this is an alarmist presentation. I'm trying to literally sound an alarm. I don't know if literally in this sense, something close to sounding an alarm. Um, but I wanna emphasize just how much um, this goes against my kind of instinct. My instinct is to try to dial down, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, alarmism that sometimes um, is at the heart of our public discourse in really deeply unhealthy ways. In fact, my next book coming out um, next week actually is the title is One Church. It's an attempt to it's an attempt to dial down the kind of right left polarization um, and have unity within diversity. A handbook for finding uh, unity within diversity. But I think the issues at stake here are just so important that I really want to raise the alarm. I want to begin with this gravestone. Some of you are likely very familiar with the case of Terry Schiavo, others of you maybe not. I'm not going to get into too much detail about it, but Terry Schiavo in the um, early part of this century uh, really, really captured the imagination of people all around the world, but especially the United States. She was said to be in a so-called vegetative state, and there was a big fight between her, um, essentially her husband um, and her parents about what should be done. Should she be continued to given, be given care or should she be um, dehydrated and starved to death? And uh, the, her husband won saying uh, that, that this is what she would have wanted. And, she, and he got to write the words that appeared on her gravestone right here. And I think what these words are really, really relevant to the kind of case I want to make. So I figured I'd start with it. Um, according to Mr. Shivo, he said that his wife departed this earth in 1990 when she had her catastrophic brain injury. And she was at peace when she uh, was finally dehydrated and starved to death in 2005. Now, this is very interesting, right? It's incredibly interesting because what this is saying um, is that somebody's um, kind of spirit or soul can leave a living body and essentially depart this earth. I'm not exactly sure that's, you know, that he went into much, you know, metaphysical detail about that, but that's essentially what has to follow from this. But what's so interesting about this claim is that he's going to have to say that this individual, this is Terry Schiavo right here, 
uh, departed this earth. And I just wanted to play a clip because we can talk about cases all we want, but sometimes it's, it's good, especially in this milieu where we can play video, just try to connect as much we, as, as we can to the individual themselves. So this is Terry Schiavo from 2002, Listening to Music. If you can't hear that, let me know, please. So what could it possibly mean to say that, that this individual had already departed this earth by this point, right? This is clearly a living member of the species Homo sapiens, a living member of the human family, clearly a disabled individual, right? Um, but clearly a living member of our, our human family. What I want to suggest is we've kind of capitulated as a culture, especially a medical secularized culture, to a Manichaean dualism, which makes this hard distinction between our bodies, which are kind of accidentally who we are, um, and our kind of spirits, or, or the kind of thing that can depart this earth while a living body kind of uh, stays behind. But I wanna argue actually that the groundwork for this fa fantastically um, bad idea uh, was laid actually decades before 2002 or 2005. And here, let's get into a little bit of, of some uh, not too distant history, but history nonetheless. So this is uh, Dr. Robert Ebert, who was the dean of Harvard Medical School from 1965 to 1977. And uh, Dean Ebert had a problem uh, very soon after he uh, got uh, his position. And his the problem's name was Henry uh, K. Beecher. Uh, Dr. Beecher was the very famous, or in my, in some cases, uh, infamous anesthesi anesthesiologist and chairperson of Harvard Medical School's Institutional Review Board. He kept pushing uh, his dean to change the definition of death and was very clear about the reason why. He said, quote, every major hospital has patients stacked up waiting for suitable donors. And he was successful, um, Dr. Beecher was, in petitioning his boss to establish what would become the famous or again, perhaps infamous uh, 1968 ad hoc committee of the Harvard Medical School to examine the definition of brain death. And he also succeeded in getting the outcome he wanted from that commission, namely switching from a, cardio, a cardiopulmonary only uh, definition um, to, uh, to one that included brain death um, uh, brain death as well, but only, importantly, only after a failed first draft of the committee's report was sent to Ebert's office, Ebert's office and he sent it back for revisions with, with a number of notes, including this very important note. Um, it suggests that you wish to define death in order to make viable organs more readily available to persons requiring transplants. So whatever we think of um, the concept of brain death as, as a concept today, its historical origins are clear. Um, they really wanted to change the definition of brain death so that we could get uh, more organs um, for transplant, which is a good thing. You know, it's a good end, but the means are obviously problematic. We don't want to just label people dead so that we can get their organs, right? And of course, this takes place in the context not just of being able to um, transplant organs, but also um, having ventilators, uh, the, the invention of the ventilator, right? And, and having folks um, stay alive on ventilators that previously were not able to be kept alive. But despite these dubious origins um, as a way of maximizing resources, and this is a key theme throughout my presentation, maximizing resources, economic issues, justice, just allocation of scarce uh, resources is a, is a really important theme. Um, this view of the human person has become the law in all 50 states with only really New Jersey, my, my home state of New Jersey, allowing for very clear religious freedom exemptions. In fact, you might think religious freedom in the United States refers primarily to some kind of conservative um, Christian 
uh, you know, group, but it was actually as part of my research for the book, I found out it was local Orthodox Jews in my um, in my area, my home state of New Jersey, who who had this uh, a vision of of the human person that was incompatible with this and carved out this religious exemption for themselves. And this particular exemption, New Jersey, would become very important for the next case I want to talk about, which is the case of Jahai uh, McMath. Um, let me just play a little clip um, about her story. She was thought to be brain dead as well. She was in, um, she and her family lived in California. She also had a catastrophic brain uh, injury. Um, uh, and and uh, a long story short, she was, she and her family were forced to take her to New Jersey to care for her. Um, but here's, here's a little video clip on, on her story. Months after several neurologists declared her brain dead, a Bay Area family wants that ruling reversed. KPI X5's Linda Yee shows us the video that Jahai McMath's family says is proof that she is alive. Linda? Well, Ken, the video clips do show movement, but are they what some neurologists say are spontaneous reflexes common in brain dead patients, or is it truly a miracle? Come on, girl. Come on, girl. She moved her foot on command, says Jahai's mother, and as the days passed, there was more. Very good. Very good, Jahai. Nyla Winkfield has been by her daughter's bedside for the past nine months. So then I said, okay, well, move your thumb if you can hear me. And then she moves her thumb again, so I said, okay. So she knows the difference between left and right. She knows her fingers. If I say move your leg, she can. that's something that she can do with no issues. The family's attorney showed brain scans and EEG results. To bolster their argument, the neurosurgeons at Oakland's Children's Hospital were wrong when they said Jahai was brain dead. And a panel of whom they describe as experts with the International Brain Research Foundation spoke of the findings by... Just to give you a sense of, again, a person here, right? A human being here. Um, one thing we already knew even before Jahai was that uh, human beings who were thought to be brain dead can fight off infections, respond to and heal um, bodily trauma. Uh, Jahai um, actually reached puberty after the state of California had declared her dead. She got her first period um, after being declared dead. Um, and and brain dead individuals um, who have been pregnant have also successfully gestated uh, prenatal children to birth. Um, those are also very odd uh, things for dead individuals to do, right? Um, but think, I want you to think, especially in light of the argument I'm making about our current secularized medical culture, about how her medical team um, handled this. This is uh, Dr. David Durand, a pediatrics chief at UC San Francisco, who is essentially the boss of everyone and, and of her medical team there. Um, what is it that you don't understand? Dr. Duran condescendingly asked her family. Then according to Jahai's mother, stepfather, grandfather, brother, and their lawyer who took notes, Duran pounded his fist on the table saying she's dead, dead, dead. Not exactly a bedside manner you're looking for. What happened here? Well, as um, the introduction um, of my bio mentioned, I've, I've written a lot about Peter Singer and I have a deep respect for Peter Singer. Actually, he's gonna retire um, from Princeton this year and he invited me to be part of his um, kind of final go around with his graduate students. They're gonna have me in next week, Tuesday um, to kind of talk about his work. He, he's inviting his critics in good philosopher fashion. He's inviting his critics to be with him like sort of his final go around. Um, for his final graduate seminar. So I'm really looking forward to that next week. I think Peter Singer, as a, as a pro-life Catholic moral theologian and bioethicist, I think he's deeply wrong, but he's wrong in very interesting ways because he gets a lot right on his way to being wrong. And in fact, I think he gets the very basics often right and just reasons the wrong way from those basics. So Peter Singer, I think, rightly sees what happened with brain death as totally transformative for medicine, bioethics, and the culture. Um, he agrees that it's very odd to claim that, that supposedly dead individuals fight off infections, gestate children, enter puberty, react to bodily trauma. Um, 
you know, that sort of thing. And what in fact he says happened with the Harvard Brain Death Commission is what the subtitle of this book suggests, the collapse of our traditional ethics, the collapse of fundamental human equality. Uh, Peter Singer says, there has been a Copernican revolution against fundamental human equality with this. Um, and I think he's just 100% right about that. Instead, you know, the Copernican revolution was against, you know, of course, the earth being at the center and having a, uh, instead of a geocentric uh, universe, a, a very different kind of universe, um, you know, a kind of moral universe that has the human being at the center is one that he thinks we've had a Copernican revolution against as well. The, the idea that human beings bearing a common nature that reflects the image and likeness of God has been abandoned in favor of an ethic which located moral value in something other than bearing uh, the common human nature. And it's interesting to note that Peter Singer throughout his work struggles to have any basis for human equality at all or equality at all. And I don't think that's accidental. So I think he's just right about what has happened here. He thinks it's a good thing. I think it's a bad thing. And if we look at what is going on with brain death and Jahai McMath later, I think something very interesting reveals itself. Despite Dr. Durand pounding his fist and condescendingly talking to the family the way he did, this Journal of Neurological Sciences article says, actually, maybe Jahai wasn't brain dead. Maybe she had something called responsive unawake syndrome, this kind of neologism invented category of diagnosis. and. Um, and it's interesting, right? Like, uh, how can a medical team be just so unbelievably confident that she's brain dead to the point where they, are, they will pound their fists on the table um, against the family uh, and 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 then just be so wrong about this? So either this is kind of an attempt to cheat, a kind of fancy way of reframing what brain death is, or maybe there is such a thing as brain death and we're just totally diagnosing it wrong. Either way, we're in really bad shape with with regard to brain death. Now let's go back to so-called vegetative state. If, if you're interested in these questions, I just highly recommend this book, Rights Come to Mind by uh, Joe Finn's Brain Injury Ethics and the Struggle for Consciousness. Especially if you're kind of still living in 2005 era of what we thought about vegetative state, this book, which was written uh, back in 2015, but is I think very modern because very few people know of what we've actually learned in the intervening time. It's just totally worth your time. And Joe Finn's, um, who, who is also here in New York as a bioethicist, is by no means a pro-life Catholic Christian or anything like that. In fact, he and I have had a few uh, debates like Peter Singer um, about these matters, and we have very different points of view. But on this, uh, he's also right, uh, I believe. Um, you know, how many times have you heard the term PVS or persistent vegetative state or permanent vegetative state, um, even though he and others have really insisted that we now need to use different language? And after Finns, we're just without excuse. We now know that after this book, that a relatively high percentage of patients lumped into this category. And it's not, to be fair, it's, a, it's again, a kind of slippery category, but a very high percentage, um, a relatively high percentage of patients lumped into this category actually respond to therapeutic interventions. And as Finns notes, um, you know, one of the reasons um, that this is so challenging for him to write about is the vegetative state has become something of a catechism in North American bioethics. Again, I think that's a very well-chosen word on his part, given the ideological commitments to vegetative state. Uh, but Finn speaks dramatically and movingly about the need to think of um, this as a battle for the basic civil rights of this population, right? If, in fact, this population is a deeply, deeply um, brain-injured, disabled population, um, then we need, then based on how we're treating them, especially dehydrating and starving them to death, um, there's obviously major issues of fundamental justice uh, and human equality here. Why hasn't his call for civil rights been heeded? Well, Finns says that despite uh, the stunning evidence to the contrary, the clinical response to patients in so-called PBS has been prognostic pessimism and therapeutic uh, nihilism. And why, why has that been the reaction? Well, he thinks, getting back to a really important theme, um, the commitment of healthcare resources uh, is considered just too large uh, to do these therapeutic, which they are time and resource intensive um, interventions. Um, and then the perceived fixity, here's an ideological question. So an, an economic or ju just allocation to resource 
question and then in, and then an ideological question. The perceived fixity of so-called PBS could undermine the hard one right to die, including the iconic case of Terry Schiavo. Indeed, he asked provocatively, without the futility of permanent vegetative state of permanent unconsciousness, are we pro, pro, um, obliged to promote a culture of life? And that was the that was the underlying, uh, frankly, uh, so much of the underlying debate um, in the Terry Schiavo case uh, in the early aughts. Um, there was a sense that you know um, uh, pro-life pro-life individuals who were also anti-abortion were on one side of this, and those who were on the other side of this. Um, were, were pro-choice or in favor of abortion rights. And Finns mentions time and time again that, that perhaps there's also a looming threat to abortion rights here because these issues are interlocked um, and connected with each other. And that's what I wanna to turn to next. So uh, the recent Dobbs uh, decision, um, whatever you think of it, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of it uh, in favor of prenatal justice. Um, this doesn't give us prenatal justice, of course, it just gives us the chance to argue for prenatal justice in the public sphere and have it matter legislatively. But the uh, the cases that it replaced were both um, Roe versus Wade, but even more importantly, Planned Parenthood versus Casey. That was the 1992 decision that actually replaced Roe versus Wade in terms of its reasoning. It, it upheld the central holding of Roe, but really in a very different way. It reasoned in a very different way. And one of the very key um, ways it reasoned um, uh, was uh, in the following um, uh, paragraph that I have here on the screen. So it said, um, for two decades of economic and social developments, again, there's uh, economic uh, there, uh, people have organized intimate relationships and made choices that define their, their views of themselves and places in society in reliance on abortion in the event that contraception should fail. The ability of women to participate equally in the economic, again, there's that word, and social life of the nation have been um, has been facilitated by their ability to control their reproductive lives. So a very, very important um, part of the reasoning of the um, the majority in Casey, which again replaced Roe versus Wade in, in upholding abortion rights, was basically that in order to be fair to women economically, uh, we have to have broad access to abortion rights, which means uh, that we cannot have fundamental human equality for prenatal uh, human beings. Uh, are you sensing a pattern here? Um, we it, These are concerns with all three sets of issues we've looked at so far. Here's a um, disturbing but relevant and very revealing case of this concern in action. So there was this infamous uh, Indiana abortion doctor, Dr. Erliff Klofner, who kept thousands of bodies and body parts of prenatal children in his garage, even the trunk of his car. And as a result of that, um, media became interested in his broader uh, story. And what I want to focus on is, is the broader story, not that case as horrific as it is, but local media, um, and I want to pick on a story from uh, 2019 from CBS Chicago. They started digging around his broader dealings and they interviewed a woman whose name they kept private, who was, you know, treated. I don't know if that's really the right word for it by Dr. Klofner. Um, she, when she heard the story, um, she thought, oh my God, I did this awful thing and my children are possibly held in a box somewhere in a house. I cried. She had had her twins uh, aborted by him at some point. Um, and she said, uh, I, I said, just said to myself, I can't bring my kids into this situation. I can't bring my kids into poverty. I can't bring my kids to a father who won't love them or want them. And then she reported him saying, if you don't do this, it'll cost you $240,000 to take care of a kid. So would you rather just deal with that? Or, or would you rather deal with that? Or would you rather just go back home um, to your regular life? There was no emotion. There was no empathy. Um, so that's the that's a, uh, unfortunately an all too common example of the kind of thing that happens when we think about um, how the Casey plurality um, and majority uh, thought about these questions, these economic um, questions. Now, one of the things that I think Peter Singer gets interestingly right as well is once you reject uh, the uh, moral status and fundamental equality of the prenatal child, there's really no distinction to be made between the uh, uh, prenatal human being and the neonatal human being. In fact, um, sometimes the if the child is born prematurely, say 23, 24, 25 weeks, 
um, the prenatal uh, child inside her mother's body is significantly more advanced than the baby in the neonatal intensive care unit. And so he's argued for, for many years now, and this is one of the things that made him very controversial, that if we uh, should be pro-choice for abortion, we'd be uh, pro-choice for infanticide as well. Um, and that's because he, uh, like so many others, think of abortion as primarily about reproductive autonomy, not bodily autonomy. So bodily autonomy is very famously exhibited in the maybe the famous, most famous article ever written on abortion by Judith Jarvis Thompson, which imagined that abortion is kind of like removing yourself from an unconscious violinist who has been attached to your body for nine months. And do you have to stay attached to the unconscious violinist? For nine months. No, says Thompson, you can remove yourself even if you foresee but don't intend that the unconscious violinist will die. And that's what abortion is like. But and that's the bodily autonomy view. But the reproductive autonomy view, which again was what um what was what uh, uh the Casey majority was about, right? The kind of um a, autonomy, not about about uh bodily autonomy, but about you know, with regard to economics and e economic justice. And what's so interesting about this too, and this, this gets into one of the reasons why I'm so alarmist in my presentation here. Um, I wrote this article back in, um, in April for the public discourse saying that the logic of aiming at death um, in abortion is now uh, unsurprisingly, unsurprisingly like what I just said, moving to the neonatal uh, intensive care unit. Um, in fact, uh, the Reproductive Health Act in New York um, when it was passed, which made abortion uh, like almost totally uh, without limit in, in New York State, um, explicitly said, um, hey, uh, you know, if you want to, uh, if you want to have, uh, well, the, the law before that said, if you want to have an abortion after viability, which is about 22 weeks now, 21 weeks, six days, five days, maybe is the earliest the baby can survive outside the mother. Um, that you had to have two doctors present, one for the abortion and one in case the baby was born alive and you had a doctor specifically to take care of the child. After the Reproductive Health Act was passed, New York law changed to go from two doctors being present to only one doctor being present. And then there, there have been a lot of concerns about what, what happens when there's a failed abortion, a baby is born alive. You know, Is the baby cared for like a fellow member of the species Homo sapiens or are we in a reproductive autonomy um, uh, stage where really what we're asking um, is, do we have the right to a dead baby at the end of the day, rather than a right to a, a, a body, a reproductive or, a, you know, a bodily autonomy. And, and just to show you that this is not some kind of, uh, you know, theoretical um, concern, there is this case uh, in New Zealand of a mother um, whose, uh, whose child was um, diagnosed with spina bifida prenatally, and the uh, medical team, which is not unusual in the rich developed West, said, uh, basically, do you want to uh, have an abortion, right, because the child is disabled? Um, and the parents said, no, we don't want an abortion. We're not having an abortion, despite many, many uh, times being asked about this. This is parents who don't, who choose not to have abortions in the cases where their children are disabled report this time and time again. They get asked about it over and over. Um, but then the, her, her doctor said something very interesting. She said, okay, you don't have to have the abortion, but just know that if you have the baby, we can choose not to treat the baby after birth if you would, if you would uh, prefer that. Based not on the health, the you know, overall health and, and uh, some sort of failure to thrive or something, but just on the basis of her disability. That's what, that's what she was told. And so ableism looms large uh, throughout these debates um, uh, uh, here in ways that are, that are very significant. So let's, um, these are all issues that I think are live and here, and we've been talking about for, for some time now. And I just wanna put a pin in this first part of the discussion and um, talk about a confluence of several interrelated factors as a summary uh, statement here before we go on to what I think we need to worry about going forward. These are all reasons to worry, I think. These are four, three or four cases, uh, sets of cases that are just all, all worthy of of raising the alarm, but but let's pause here and say all of the cases that we've looked at thus far involve the secularization of medicine and the rise and dominance of irreligious bioethics. This Copernican revolution, right, against fundamental human equality, it's not being a human being that matters, it's having these um, abilities, right, a kind of ableist view. Deep pressure on medical and other resources that push us to say, well, you know, 
in light of these limited resources, maybe we should consider this population not our equals, right? Um, and then interlocking and mutually reinforcing dependent views about moral status in relation to brain death, PVS, abortion, more. So, you know, this idea that it's a house of cards, right? That if you if you remove one, um, these other commitments that we have to abortion or to the right to die or these other things might all come crashing down, which incidentally I think is probably correct. But what's next? What should, what where is this going if we stay on the current trajectory? Well. Here, I think Peter Singer looms large again. He um, he very famously said that, hey, it's it's not just the fact that human beings that aren't rational and self-aware at the beginning of life um, or with really catastrophic brain injuries or brain death or something like that. Um, even those who have dementia, especially later stage dementia, who've lost their rationality or, and self-awareness, they also don't count as persons. In fact, he was taken to task for this um, by many people when his own mother, Cora Singer, got later stage dementia and lost her rationality and self-awareness and really was um, in a situation where, which he had described as being a human non-person, right? A human non-person. Living human being, obviously, but losing the traits that matter, the abilities uh, that matter. And, um, and he used his resources to care for her, but he had argued that um, persons deserve our resources, medical resources, especially scarce medical resources, going back to that concern. Um, but human non-persons don't deserve our medical resources, right? Especially when there are so many persons um, who don't have adequate, adequate access to healthcare. But he cared for her. And, and interestingly, he said, um, oh, you know what, what this really is about is, is my own weakness and inconsistency. It's not it's not that I've changed my mind about this. I still think my mom was probably a human non-person, but it was just really hard for me to follow my view uh, consistently. And sometimes my students get on him for this. And like, especially if you're Christians, be careful if the, you know, if the, if our ethic is is uh, is proven false by the fact that those who say it's true don't live it out perfectly, then Christians are in deep trouble. Not just Peter Singer. But still, I think that's where we need to focus. Uh, uh, now, especially in light of what the pandemic revealed about how we um, how we treat people with dementia. I don't know if you saw some of the stories during the really thick part of the pandemic, um, but there were lots and lots of so-called excess deaths from people with dementia that weren't from COVID, right? Um, in fact, this, the headline under that Politico investigation, the, the subheader is a quote, um, saying that from Robert Anderson, the chief of mortality statistics at the CDC, saying there's something going on and it needs to be sorted out. I'm not sure we really have it sorted out yet. I think we just know that the way we treat people with um, with later stage dementia is horrible, with some exceptions, but overall in the main, horrible. And here is where a, um, a section of rights come to mind. Remember that book that Joe Finns wrote on PVS? He interviewed someone who said the following their patients, uh, they were uh, talking about their parents' uh, nursing home that had a floor where the staff, quote, just put everyone who had no opportunity, no prospect of being very alive, Alzheimer's patients, people who were in PVS. So had, they had this horrible second floor. If you went up there, it was filthy. The staff was bad. So it's interesting, right? They This, this nursing home just decided to put both Alzheimer's patients and PVS patients on the same floor. It was kind of where they dumped them which is classic throwaway culture. This is an, another book I wrote, Resisting Throwaway Culture, on the views of Pope Francis on this. The, the Pope Francis made the phrase uh, throwaway culture uh, famous, at least in my, in my world. Um, but but that's, that's a classic example of, of throwaway culture. And, and I think what this reveals is that we are already um, are putting the, this category of individuals into, um, at least, if not explicitly, at least implicitly into human non-person category as well. Um, and in my book, Losing Our Dignity, um, I, I show uh, in some detail where this is headed, especially in light of um, the huge numbers of people who are going to get uh, developed dementia over the next 20 years. And I apologize for the, uh, for the melodramatic music in the book trailer that my publisher put together, but I just thought, because it summarizes my argument so well, I'll play about maybe 50 seconds of this trailer as well. I know, it's the last thing you want to think about. 
but consider the COVID-19 pandemic with me for a moment. I'd invite you to think not about the virus, but about what it has exposed. There's something going on and it needs to be sorted out. That's a quote from Robert Anderson, Chief of Mortality Statistics at the CDC. Our unspoken horror story in this country is how we treat people in nursing homes, especially those suffering from dementia. Worldwide, more than 50 million people are living with dementia. And that number will double every 20 years. Nurses are abandoning the profession, leaving nursing homes understaffed. People can make better money at Walmart than they can by caring for our most vulnerable. This is on track to get worse and spiral into a crisis. A crisis that touches everyone and damages everything. Society can therefore choose one of three paths. First, we can slouch towards robot care, which isn't real care because it isn't human. Second, we could slide into euthanasia, solving a social problem by killing those who need care. The third option is to move with urgency to restore human dignity. A challenging path, but one with clear social and moral benefits and one with a strong pre-existing foundation. So if you think that's too dramatic and I can understand why, given that melodramatic music, um, I just have three headlines here that show that it really isn't. I mean, we already know that Canada, our neighbors to the north have already explicitly um, legalized euthanasia for the disabled uh, in ways that are really horrific. I don't know if you're paying attention to what's going on up there, but um, it's all right. It's the slippery slope there has been unbelievably fast. In fact, they've already, this is a little bit of an aside, but they've already told people who have, um, who are in public housing, where the public housing, the environment of the public housing because of the paint or something is causing them really severe distress um that when they ask for different kind of housing they say no we, we won't give you new housing but if you would like assisted suicide we can give you that so basically basically they're now offering assisted suicide in canada just because you're poor and you can't afford uh, appropriate housing um but they explicitly made it legal for uh people who are disabled um and we already do this um uh by omission very significantly um so for instance with terry shivo what the way she was killed was was by withholding food and water um there's <laughs> this happens sometimes already on the down low but we some some activists want to make it explicit and here is a really sort of unbelievable article from the hastings center report i wouldn't share it otherwise because it seems so you know bonkers but the hastings center report is one of the most respected secular bioethics journals in the country if not the world um, and these very reputable um, bioethicists argue that maybe we should have advanced directive implants for people with dementia so that if you if you kind of deteriorate to the point where you can't make a decision, your advanced directive implant will kill you. Here's something we're already doing, though, um, in the United States. The New York Times did this really important expose showing that at least 21% of nursing home residents are on antipsychotic drugs despite the fact that they don't have an antipsychotic um, uh, maladies or, or psychotic maladies of any kind. Um, in fact, the reason why these are used is to essentially put folks in a chemical straitjacket. So they essentially don't have to be moved or to move or to keep control of them. And there are, there are challenges related to resource and staffing issues. That's the reason why. That's one of the reasons I point out in the book trailer right with so many nurses leaving and, and so much turnover and so little pay for these folks um you know they really are overwhelmed um and so you know sometimes it's nefarious but other times it's really just you don't know what else to do because they're so understaffed so they give them um these antipsychotic uh drugs um that in fact doubles their chances of death though um and it's no accident, I believe, that it's mostly people with dementia who are giving these drugs. I think we're, all, again, we're already kind of sliding into this uh, place where we say, hey, these are human non-persons. They might be human beings, right? Living human beings, but they've lost the abilities that we consider to be valuable. 
let me close by just offering some uh, reflections on how uh, to respond to this. Again, um, my goal here was essentially to raise the alarm. So um, I want to say, hey, look at this, um, absorb it, think about it, take it into your heart and mind and, and think about how to appropriately uh, respond to this, especially over the next 20 years, this is going to turn into a real disaster. And we need to be thinking about how we're going to respond to it. And let's speak out as clearly uh, as we can. Um, and part of how we would speak, uh, speak about clearly is if you have theological points of view um, that lead to your own conclusion that these that human equality doesn't matter when it comes to what you can do or your abilities, but matters based on the kind of creature you are, right? The kind of um, kind to which you belong, a homo sapiens, right? Um, then speak out about that theological point of view. Don't hide it under a bushel. Um, uh, put it up for all the world uh, to see. Um, for too long, I think, uh, those of us that have had this view, and I include myself in this, have, have felt the need to hide or kind of translate this view away or, you know, not wanting to offend people or in the light of um, diversity and uh, whatever. Um, but that time has passed. It's time to stand very clearly for fundamental human equality. And, and happily, we're not the only ones. Like Christians, of course, are not the only ones uh, to hold this view. As I mentioned, Orthodox Jews here in New Jersey were very much uh, the ones that carved out the religious uh, freedom exemption. Uh, many Muslims also hold this view of human equality. The so-called Abrahamic religions very much share this, uh, this point of view. And there are some secular folks who share this point of view as well. But um, for too long, I think we've uh, not been as clear as we need to be about this and, this and the results speak for themselves. Here's a hopeful thing though, because I imagine with the first three sets of issues and 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 um, uh, and cases, uh, it was it was not lost on anyone watching just how politicized those issues are. And again, I'm I'm very sensitive about right left polarization. I want to dial down that kind of polarization, that kind of um, heat rather than light. Um, but I understand the challenge with that. I wrote a book called Beyond the Abortion Wars, trying to dial it down, but you know, it's tough when, especially in a post dobbs environment. What, what is so attractive to me or hopeful to me, maybe is a better word, about the dementia crisis is that it has not yet been politicized. It doesn't feel to me, and I'd be curious what you think about this if you have thoughts in the Q&A, but um, it doesn't feel to me like this has been politicized along the right or the left yet. Um, and with that, I think maybe it could be a bridge for dialogue. And actually, that's in the three steps that I have there in the three bullet points that I finish up with. That's the second of the three uh, steps. I am imagining about like a, you know, a short and medium and long term kind of responses. The second bullet point is what I imagine, I guess, the medium term response to this, which is, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe a decade or so of just trying to build dialogue, right, working with disability rights groups other religious groups to say, we need to reclaim this vision of human equality um, in light of <laughs> everything that I've mentioned over the last 45 uh, minutes or so, but especially in light of the coming dementia crisis over the next generation. It's just, again, gonna be horrific if we don't figure out what to do here. Um, so let's make, I'm, I'm deeply committed to dialogue. Um, I'm a huge fan of the Focolare, a Catholic apostolate of uh, lay apostolate, which is all about dialogue, in fact, and and we need to be all in with that as a culture, as a as a as a Catholic culture for sure. Um, but we can also do things right now, not necessarily over time, but even uh, in, over a longer time, like a decade or so. But we can do things like right now, or within a year or so, like as individuals, families, communities. Um, one of the things that I have encouraged many of our uh, religious leaders in the Catholic Church to do is take a look at, for instance, all the empty um, convents and uh, rectories and schools, especially here in the Northeast, right, and say, well, how can we, currently they're either empty or they're kind of being, you know, let out for various things. Uh, can we repurpose those spaces um, 
uh, to build a culture, a, a space of culture and encounter with people with dementia and, and our elderly um, instead of a, the throwaway culture that currently exists. The Pope Francis says that a, we need to build a culture of encounter and hospitality as a kind of antidote to um, the throwaway culture. I firmly believe he's right about that. And maybe that's one of the ways that we can build a culture of encounter and hospitality as a church um, is make spaces that actually allow for um, encounter across difference. I even, uh, in my own home parish here, um, in New Jersey, we have a school, uh, right, an empty school, and also now an empty convent. I kind of have these delusions of grandeur of um, kids being in the school and uh, elderly and disabled in the convent and actually having cross-generational encounters uh, as part of as part of this. It's interesting that some of the loneliest people in our culture are young people, especially those that are kind of you know, addicted to social media or their screens, right? And, uh, and also older people um, who are in their rooms, often watching television all day long, having very few visitors. You know, if we did this right, I think we could really create cultures of encounter and hospitality, not just, you know, um, you know, in the ways that we might typically think of it, like having more visitors or something like that, but in really creative ways that could be even intergenerational. And of course, we can make decisions as individuals and families, right? Like, I don't know about you, but I'm a Gen Xer and, and my baby boomer parents said basically to all three of us kids, you know, go out and do your thing. Don't worry about us. In fact, they didn't even really say don't worry about us. It was understood that we're not going to worry about them. That was the sense. And so we went to, I grew up in the Midwest, but we went to all three as far as we could, Southwest and East, all three of us. And now my parents are in their seventies in the Midwest and none of us are there. Um, and it's heartbreaking. All three of us are trying to think, how can we get there? What's going on? You know, how are we, how are they going to be taken care of? But maybe that's part, that's also something we can do, right? Is like thinking about how do we make sure there's not just this floor where everyone's kind of thrust into where they're given a, a chemical straitjacket, but, you know, given good care, given loving care, and again, a culture of encounter and hospitality as opposed to throwaway culture. And then I'll just wrap up here by thinking about something difficult. Uh, again, a lot of things that were difficult um, in the presentation, but you know, it's not guaranteed that we're going to succeed in our cultural dialogue, right? In fact, there is a chance that we'll fail and that the broader secularized medical culture and the broader secularized, secularized culture in general, which is becoming more and more secular, um, will simply move in the direction of thinking of, um, of, uh, of, of human beings with dementia as human non-persons. And, um, and then I think it's going to be time for the church to be the church and step up as we have in ages past and say, um, you know, we will care for these individuals. We will be the ones. Come to our hospitals, come to our clinics, come to our parishes, come to our homes, um, and we will take care of you. Even if the broader culture will not, um, we will make a space for that. And I, I actually wonder if that might be a sign of evangelization. One of the key things that the early church did um, in order to grow, they didn't do it in order to grow, but it ended up being one of the reasons they did grow um, was during very serious medical emergencies in the ancient world. It was just well known that Christians stood around um, and, and hung out with the sick during, uh, you know, uh, epidemics and pandemics and natural disasters and whatnot. Um, and that kind of radical love for the other was a tremendous, tremendous tool of, of evangelization. People wanted to be around that love. They wanted to be around communities of people that would sacrifice and and again, provide a culture of welcome and hospitality um, and, and encounter this way. Um, and maybe this could be a, a time, if, if in fact uh, it comes to it, it might, it might be a time for the church to be the church again um, in that way. And, and, and we do have the resources. One of the things that, that it, and I'll finish with this point, that the church does have, uh, especially in the United States, is, is a very robust healthcare system. In fact, one in seven uh, beds in the United States um, is in a Catholic uh, facility. And, um, and when you combine that with the, these other, you know, physical plants or, you know, buildings that, that maybe could be repurposed and whatnot, there are things we can do just as a church um, that I think uh, could loom large here in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a very unfortunate situation where it's basically up to us and maybe a few other um, uh, uh, folks from other faiths who, who need to step up here. Okay, I'll stop there and see if you have any questions for me.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kamosi, for that um, wonderful and very enlightening uh, and challenging lecture. Uh, we now have an opportunity to engage directly with our distinguished speaker. So please feel free to submit your questions for Professor Kamosi via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We ask that you please avoid using the chat box to submit questions. It is now my pleasure to introduce our Q&A moderator for this evening, Dr. Michael McGravy. Dr. McGravy is Assistant Professor of Religious Studies and Director of the Institute for Theology uh, and Pastoral Studies. Thank you, Dr. Deepergola, and thank you, Dr. Kemese, for a wonderful presentation. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have been uh, sent in, and then uh, you may be able to see the live question here. So we'll start with that one. Are you including people with behavioral health issues and substance use issues as part of our throwaway culture? Yeah, um, it's it's not exactly um, it's not exactly the kind of issue I was focused on in this presentation because I was focused on uh, explicitly human beings who are explicitly <laughs> thought of as not being persons, right? Uh, human non-persons. And while while the population that was mentioned is definitely part of throwaway culture, it's it's not just human non-persons that are thrown away and discarded, obviously, right? There's a, there's a lot of human beings that everyone agrees are human beings that are also discarded and thrown to the margins. And, and those with substance abuse problems and, and mental health issues are definitely in that um, in that category as our culture. And and we see, you know, we see this on the streets of our cities, right? We see this in our refusal uh, to build adequate housing and, and, and care facilities. Um, so yes, uh, that is definitely, we need to create a culture of encounter and hospitality uh, for those uh, populations as well. Um, but again, my my main and we could walk and chew gum at the same time here, right? It's if if we could if we if we cultivate a culture of encounter and hospitality, it won't just be for the populations I mentioned this evening. It will also be broadly for for all populations at risk of our throw, at risk via our throwaway culture. Okay, another question that was sent in, um, given the rise of secularity in the culture, how can Catholic institutions of higher education with programs in the health sciences train future generations of healthcare providers to focus on the dignity of the person and fight against the temptation to do otherwise? And how do you aim to do that at Creighton? Yeah, it's a it's a challenge. I'm not I'm not going to lie. One of the reasons why we've tended not to talk too much about this is because it's a challenge. You know, um, again, we want to be understandably and rightly we want to be as welcoming as we can be to all sorts of uh, you know different points of view. But I think as we've seen, maybe with the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement and so many other movements of social justice. We are willing as uh, Catholic institutions, right, to stand up for certain values, right, and say, this is who we are. And these are um, values we're not willing to punt on and to sort of explain away. Uh, they come from the most fundamental parts of who we are, the, the foundation of nonviolence and dignity of the human person, right, and the radical equality of all. Um, and so, you know, it's maybe a little bit easier based on, let's be honest, about how campus cultures work to be explicit about those um, sets of issues. But the time has come, I think, to really be just as explicit about these issues of fundamental justice and fundamental equality, despite, um, you know, the pitfalls and despite. But but I think at least what I've tried to lay out is, um, especially in my dialogue with people like Joe Finns and with Peter Singer is, you can be deeply, deeply in dialogue with people who have different points of view, right? And to say, we are committed to arguments and evidence and engagement with people who, who aren't like us. And you are welcome in those conversations too. And this is going to be an academic discussion. Um, but this is where we stand, you know, when it comes to fundamental justice and fundamental equality. And my hope is, I hope it's not, a, I, I hope it's not a naive hope, but my hope is that when the alternatives are presented, right? When, you know, especially when the, the the things that have led to what I just laid out over the last hour or so are presented, um, 
you know, a, a position like the one the church holds on fundamental human equality is given a shot um, in ways that it might not have been given before, right? If, if one can see, for instance, that the same vision of human equality, which leads to uh, Terry Schiavo counting as a human being, um, leads to, uh, you know, uh, making sure that those with later stage dementia um, are treated, uh, you know, not as um, disabled people to be discarded, but as the same as everyone else. Um, uh, and we make space for them and we put resources into their care and we have a culture of encounter and hospitality with regard to them. If, if, if folks can see the connections between those two, my sense is that it becomes an easier um, thing to talk about. So there was another question in the chat, and I, I there was a typo in it, I think. So I'm gonna I'm going to interject what I think this individual is asking. So, uh, do you consider quality of life or amount of suffering when it comes to using machines to keep these individuals alive? Well, yeah. So there's, I mean, yes, but it's a qualified yes. So. Uh, it's important to note that the church has always made a distinction between ordinary and extraordinary means of treatment that, um, you know, uh, there are times where you don't need to do everything to keep someone alive. And that's deeply, deeply part of our tradition. I mean, if you just look up at Christ on the cross, you know, you don't need to do everything to keep yourself alive. If you look at the martyrs and the saints, you know, you don't need to do everything to keep yourself alive. In fact, there are times where it's appropriate not to do that. But the key, and this is a this is a philosophical distinction, but it's an important one. The key is where we're not aiming at death. We're not, which is which would be an example of violence, right? So, the martyr, properly speaking, is not aiming at their own death, right? They're acting in such a way that they foresee but don't intend death is going to be the likely result of their actions. So, something very similar happens, say, when a patient says, "Listen, I don't want to live the rest of my life that I have left to live on chemotherapy." So let's just let's go to comfort care and let's um, let me say goodbye to my family and live out the rest of my life in a particular way. That's a choice on how to live, not a choice to die. Right. And so one foresees but does not intend that death is going to be the likely result of that. And uh, and for instance, I often use my students something I jokingly call the pissed test or the would you be upset test. Right. If if somehow the the, the patient said. Uh, you know, or the, we could tell a story about how the patient lived after um, refusing the chemotherapy, right? They would not be upset, right? Because not, nothing about their goal was to kill themselves. It was to choose to lead a certain kind of life without chemotherapy. If, however, you tell the story and the person lives and they're upset by that fact, it kind of indicates that what they were aiming at was their death. So quality of life is important, but if the judgment is like the one made in the case of Terry Schiavo, say, right, where you say, well, this is either a non-person or their life is so disabled that it's not, not worth living and it's time for them to die now. So we're going to dehydrate them and starve them to death. And the it's not just merely foreseen and unintended that they're going to die, but the whole point of what Terry Schiavo's husband wanted to do was for her to die, right? then that's deeply problematic and that's aiming at death and that's violence. So uh, hopefully the, the questioner can understand what I mean by a qualified yes. If what we're aiming at is a certain way to live and you foresee that it's gonna be a limited way and it's likely gonna to lead to a death that's much more quick than it otherwise would have been, totally legit. In fact, it's not just totally legit, it's like at the heart of uh, Catholic bioethics. But if it involves aiming at death, and that's a kind of violence, and that's never okay, um, especially if it's aiming at death. So another uh, individual sent in the question, does the church view, and I'm assuming this person is referring to the Catholic Church, uh, view tube feedings as extraordinary measures? Usually not. Um, Usually the tube feedings are a kind of care. So it's not, it's not imagined as a kind of um, medical intervention. It's thought it's, it's a medical technology, but it's not the kind of technology that's being used to treat something. Um, so it's, it's, you know, a way, instead of giving somebody, you know, a spoon with food in it, 
it's another way to feed them, right? Which properly speaking is understood as care, um, not as a kind of medical treatment. Um, however, there are times where because of the nature of a feeding tube, um, the church says in very rare cases, it could be extraordinary care, not extraordinary treatment. So for instance, if the feeding tube is just incredibly painful for someone, say they had stomach cancer or something like that, or um, uh, if the feeding tube, uh, uh, if they weren't processing the food, right? If the food was just building up in the stomach and was not being digested or something like that, then you could, then you could withhold uh, that. But again, I think the intention really matters here. The, what happened with Terry Shivo and removing, in, in, in removing her feeding tube and, and not feeding her wasn't about that. It was, again, the choice to say, either she's already dead, she's departed this earth, going back to the first slide, um, or she has a life that's not worth living and it's time for her to die. So, um, th but these other cases, if you say like she's got stomach cancer and it's just too painful or her body is no longer processing food, um, those are not aiming, the, a decision to not use the feeding tube there is not aiming at that. Okay, thank you. Uh, another uh, person writes, there are Christian-based healthcare communities that care for persons with dementia and treat them with respect and equality and are also financially sustainable. Can these types of continuing care communities become exemplars of how respect for all humans can be possible in our society? Yeah, that's an excellent point. So I don't mean to paint with too broad a brush. And in the middle of the 2020 part of the pandemic, I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times that painted with too broad a brush about these things. And I got um, pushed back from Catholic Charities almost immediately saying, check out our you know, care facilities. We're doing this right. And it was a good call out uh, from them. Uh, so there are places that are doing this right. And absolutely, those are things we need to replicate um, in very serious and profound ways. And, and also it, it might be, we need to replicate them in ways that again, if we can't convince the broader culture to take this on, that we will we'll just need to supercharge this as a church, right? If we're gonna be the primary vehicles by which these folks get the care they need, um, that we're gonna have to really replicate it in a very dramatic way. Thank you. Uh, what place should quality of life determinations have in healthcare decision-making? So it's tough, right? I mean, at, at, a, at a certain point, everyone makes decisions about quality of life. So, um, you know, we, you know, even choosing where to live or, or whatever, you know, is, is a quality of life decision making process. And again, the church has said quality of life is legitimate in, in the ordinary extraordinary means distinction, just to give another example. Um, so it, especially in the ancient and medieval world, they'd often give uh, patients the advice that they needed to change the climate in which they live. They need to go live in a warmer climate, say, for their own health. Um, but the church very explicitly said, you don't need to move <laughs> to a warmer climate. If you choose not to move to a warmer climate and you foresee but don't intend that you're gonna die much more quickly, that's not aiming at your own death, right? But one could make that decision for a host of reasons, including act, you know, the expense it would mean for your family, right? It could also be just the quality of life for you and your family to say, listen, if we got a bunch of people here in London, I'm not gonna move, pick up and move everyone to Alexandria. That's not where, uh, that's not where we need to live uh, as a family, even if I foresee but don't intend that I'm gonna die much more quickly based on the medicine of the day or whatever. Um, and that, and that was a quality of, you could make a very clear quality of life uh, decision, right, based on that. Um, again, let me just emphasize, though, if the quality of life being judgment is something like this, where you say, oh, that person is really disabled, no one would want to live like that, it's time to kill them now, or it's time for them to die now. That's not what's legitimate, according to the church's teaching, right? That's, a, again, a kind of violence. We are aiming at somebody's death in light of their, um, their quality of life. Another person writes in, I don't view my dignity the way you've described. Uh, don't I have the right to, or I, excuse me, don't I have a right to reject your view and opt, for example, for assisted suicide? Where is the separation between church and health? 
Well, one of the key things I tried to mention throughout is that secular disability rights groups are very important allies in this fight. So it's not, first of all, just about uh, church. Um, uh, one of the one of the struggles we have as a current culture is the struggle about plurality and different points of view, right? We have different views about race. We have different views about sex and gender. We have different views about a host of issues, right? Um, how do we all live together with different points of view and yet come to some conclusions that are fundamental about justice and human equality, right? And it's a struggle, right? So people draw the line to different places. Uh, the church and, and, and I would say when it comes to fundamental human equality, we have to draw the line there. We can't have um, people aiming at their own deaths because they're disabled. And that's what disability rights uh, people say as well. I mean, if, if we have a culture that allows for that, um, it's very, it turns very quickly into what we have already going on in Canada, where um, the right to die quickly becomes a kind of duty to die. And a cultural coercion to die is maybe a more precise way to, to talk about it. And uh, disability rights groups have been talking about this for a very long time. Frankly, it's one of the reasons that in the United States, we haven't had um, as many states as I was expecting anyway, legalized assisted suicide um, as quickly as I would have expected. You know, the first state to do it was Oregon back in the 90s. Um, and only about, you know, 12 or 13 states have legalized it so far. And even states like New York and Connecticut have, have rejected it. It's coming up again in New York, uh, this this probably next legislative term. But one of the reasons why even in deep blue progressive states like New York is precisely because of those concerns from disability rights groups, where we say it's not all about personal autonomy. It's not all about these kind of judgments. There are norms we have to have about justice and violence. And if we're going to say that, um, you know, doctors can kill people if they and the doctors have made a judgment that their disability is so profound that it's better for them to die. Um, you know, we've just made, so far at least, many states have made a judgment that we're not going to go there. But if I had to put my, you know, prognosti prognostication hat on, I would guess this is where we're headed. You know, I, I would guess this is, um, there's so much emphasis on the, the questioner's presumption here, which is I get to decide for myself. I make my own decisions about this. It's my right, my body, my choice, my life, and my death. And that's a powerful argument. You know, it's a, I'm not going to lie. I don't agree with it, but it's a powerful argument, especially in our culture, which is very individualistic, very focused on the autonomy of the individual. And we don't, we don't focus as much about what autonomous individual choices mean for especially vulnerable populations like the disabled. Um, so if I were going to bet on it, I'd probably bet that we're going to have a situation where most people can decide this, but I really hope that we don't because for reasons I just mentioned. So you mentioned relevant moral distinctions between foresight and intention. How do Catholic moral theologians define quote unquote intention and how do I know that I'm not guilty of self-deception when I try to correctly identify my intention? Yeah, so that's one of the really important uh, things about healthcare and healthcare decision making is there's there there are some cases where the intention is pretty clear, but in many cases the the intention is not clear, even if there's no deception going on. It's, you know, um, self deception. You know, uh, in fact, people can have multiple intentions for you know, multiple reasons why they do something, which makes things even more complicated. So at times the intention isn't clear, at times there are multiple intentions present, and at times, as the questioner mentions, people can deceive themselves about what their intention actually is. So this is one reason why the Catholic Church, when it comes to um, decisions about whether to start or stop treatment or whatever, almost always allows the prudential judgment of the family or their surrogate to be the one that, that wins the day. So the church is never going to say we can do an aggressive sort of like you know, killing of somebody, and then they can say, well, my intention was X. No, the, there the intention is 100% clear. But if, if, the, if it's about removal of a feeding tube or a removal of um, a ventilator or stopping chemotherapy or something like the stuff I mentioned, generally speaking, even in a super uber duper Catholic hospital, they'll basically say, well, for reasons that we just described, intention is very difficult to really kind of determine. We should let individuals kind of make their own uh, judgments about that and tell us about this, um, and we will accept it. 
but uh, but on a personal level, there's just maybe some discernment to, if one is convinced by the kind of arguments I laid out um, and it's about individual discernment, right? Uh, then there maybe is some really tough, you know, like analy self analysis to do. Like what is going on here at the end of the day? Are we, are we removing or foregoing life-sustaining treatment because it's a choice of how to live foreseeing that death is coming sooner? Or is it about aiming at death? I mean, that is that is something that may take some discernment and may take you know um, some time to really kind of figure out. Okay, one uh, final question before we turn it back to Dr. Deepergola here: um, Will you and Peter Singer become the new Cornell West and Robbie George? <laughs> Well, I don't put myself in either of those two categories. Peter Singer would be. Um, in fact, Peter Singer and Robert George are both at Princeton have had their own their own dialogues, not quite as as uh, intimately as Cornell West has with with Robbie, but um, but maybe on a smaller scale, less known scale, scale it is something similar. Um, although, you know, um, Robbie and Cornell have the added advantage; they're both committed Christians, so they can work from that baseline. Um, uh, Peter Singer and I do not, but, but I think Peter and I see, I, I often joke that, um, the two people who saw bioethics most clearly in the eighties and nineties were Peter Singer and John Paul II. And so they just went in different directions. I think both Peter Singer and John Paul II saw what was like at stake and just went in two very different directions. And, and, and you can actually have fruitful debates that way, right? You can actually say, okay, we agree about these very important things. Now, where do we go from there? And that's actually maybe what we're missing as our, in our postmodern, you know, culture that has so many, had so many things hollowed out by deconstruction, so many fundamental truths and first principles hollowed out by deconstruction. Um, you, you know, if you can find that fundamental common ground, um, you can actually have productive debates and discussions. Our problem right now, it seems we don't have a lot of people committed to following, finding that. And, and also it's been hollowed out by the kind of deconstruction I was just talking about. But, but maybe that's, that's one thing that, that, that the relationship Peter and I have that can point to it happening. And if, if it can happen to a, you know, a pro-life Catholic moral theologian and somebody that's pro-choice for infanticide, um, you know, maybe that gives the rest of the culture hope that if we work at it, we can find a baseline for dialogue. Thank you very much, Dr. McGravy, for moderating that interactive session. And of course, uh, Dr. Komosi, for your wonderful responses. On behalf of the St. Augustine Center for Ethics, Religion, and Culture, please join me in thanking Dr. Komosi again for his exceptional insight on these timely and pressing issues. Dr. Kamosi, we are all in your debt and look forward to inviting you back to speak in person at some point in the future. As a reminder, tonight's distinguished lecture has been recorded and will be available on the Elms College YouTube channel within the next few days. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.